Hello, and welcome to the Downtown History and Beer Tour Virtual Edition, our second one of the summer. I'm Roy Pogorzowski, and this is my good friend George Cool. And we're here to facilitate good times through beer endeavors, beer adventures, and the best thing ever. And we have our local historian, Belinda Croson, right here. So welcome aboard. Let's get this journey started. So today I'm standing in front of our beautiful train station here on First Avenue South. In 1905, the town of Lethbridge incentivized, which is a really nice way of saying that they bribed, the CPR to move the divisional point from Fort McLeod to Lethbridge. A deal was made where CPR got several nice things from the town, but there was also a promise that the CPR would build a new train station. And in 1908, the train station behind us opened. When it was originally constructed, it was only half the size it is now. But you have to imagine how Lethbridge was changing around 1908 to 1910 to 1912. In 1909, the high-level bridge was completed, and we have mass immigration coming to the area around this time. So in 1910, the building was actually doubled in size with additions made at both the east end and the west end, creating the building that you see today. The building remained as the train station until the 1980s when the rail yard was moved out to Kip. And since 1987, so for the last 33 years, this building has actually served as our health unit here in Lethbridge. Now most people when they see this building would call it a CPR station. Technically it was built as a union station because the Alberta Railway and Irrigation Company, which had started as one of the Galt companies, shared office spaces here as well. So it's technically a union station and not a CPR station. Now if you are one of those people who can take a bit of a risk doing it safely, the best way to see this building is actually as you walk across the street. This building, the 1910 Galt Hospital, the original public library on 3rd Avenue, were actually designed by architects to have what's called shared view or borrowed view. So the building is actually centered right on the middle of the street. And so if you stand in the middle of the street as you're safely crossing, you'll see the most beautiful view of this building possible. If you had got off the train here in 1908, one of the things you might have been surprised to see was this whole street would have been full of churches. Between 1st Avenue South and 3rd Avenue South, oh, sorry, between 1st Avenue South and 4th Avenue South, there were four churches along this. Where we're standing here right now on 8th Street would have been the Roman Catholic Church, St. Patrick's. One block up would have been St. Augustine's Anglican. And then you saw Wesley, Wesley Methodist and then Knox Presbyterian. So if you had come here as a visitor, you would have thought that this was a town of churches because this was Church Street back in 1908. to stop one on the virtual downtown history and beer tour i'm roy pogo with my good friend george cool and uh, we're here this morning to sample some beers and and we're at sisters pub and grill and today on our tour we're trying a very unique beer it's a banana brown ale um from uh, hard knocks brewery and hard knocks brewery was established in 2017 in the black diamond area the name of the brewery is interesting because it pays homage to the hard work in that area that people, when they came and developed uh, that Black Diamond area. So it really pays tribute to the hard, no hard knocks, as, as they call it. And the two siblings that run the brewery about 10 years ago say that they uh, were having a huckleberry in uh, Montana. And as they were drinking that huckleberry, they both had this epiphany that they needed to brew and they needed to create um, their own beers. And they have. And so I'm super excited to sample this. The beer name Sun Up to Sun Down, again, pays tribute to the hard work it takes to develop an area and for all the workers around that area that work that work hard to keep it going. So that's the name, Sun Up to Sun Down, uh, in tribute to the hard work. So let's, let's have a party, right? right? You betcha. Let's dive into this bad boy. 
It's important on one of these things to get the pour right. Uh, so the temperature of the glass, sometimes even if you rinse your glass beforehand with water, you'll find that it foams uh, a lot less. So this is a nice, nice gentle pour, nice smooth. Oh yeah. Let's see, let's let the viewer think. Yeah. Who did, who got it better? Look at that, look at that perfect head. Very good. <laughs> Hold it up to the light. So the characteristics of this beer, when you look at the appearance, it can go from light to, to uh, dark yeah. brown. So this is in the dark brown side of things. So that's, uh, you know, very, very uh, appropriate for the category. And uh, it's generally clear as well. It's not a cloudy beer or anything like that. So if a beer is cloudy, often that means that there's uh, suspended solids in it, which usually means it's the yeast from the beer. And, and that's good stuff for you. It's very healthy. Yeah, and um, health is good, right? Health is good. <laughs> health is good. So the head is, uh, Roy mentioned the head. It's uh, a nice tan color, which is also appropriate for the style. And it's, it's got a reasonably good head retention. So mm -hmm. let's see what it tastes or smells yeah. like first. Let's right? smell. Yeah, let's have a smell. Let's have a taste. Mm hmm So the beer like this, nice. uh, that's got um, an iconic type of name like banana bread, it should smell like banana bread. So <laughs> th let's see if it smells like you banana know, bread. Honestly, give it a shake there, but it does. It, it do, it's got a nice sweet taste. You know, have you ever tried that banana bread, uh, that English banana bread beer? Uh, that they sell out of a few places here. I think I have tried. It's that. like very banana yeah, bread. Yes. The yeah, smell like he just came out of the kitchen. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Like it's just homemade baked banana bread. The smell emulates that quite a bit. It does. So I already can tell that I'm going to get you know a nice kind of oh, yeah. sweet up front taste with a bit of a nutty kind of backbone to it. Well, and and this one too, it's it's kind of a balance between uh, um, the hops and the malt in this. Like, it tends to be a little maltier, which means it's a little bit sweeter. Yeah. But it's yeah. hoppy too, so it's it's a pretty nice blend and. You know, bringing in those those extra flavors, those esters of of the banana bread, mm. you know, the baking part. Oh, wow. That's pretty good. Yeah, it feels like there's a party in my mouth, and everyone's invited. Oh, mm. <laughs> nice smooth finish. You know, again, you can taste a little bit of that banana in there. Um, and yeah. this beer is supposed to be medium to light bodied, as as far as uh, um, the style is concerned. I'd say this is. Medium to medium, yeah. medium plus on yeah. the body. Yeah, it's one. definitely a full, a bit more full bodied of a beer. It's nice. It goes down smooth. It's almost getting to the level of like, you know, like a Guinness type stout. You yes. Know, a bit thicker. Like you can feel it's like it's getting close to being yep. that kind of full bodied. It's nice. It's rich. You feel, you feel a bit of, I feel a little bit of spice on, on my tongue as well. And there's yep. a little bit of warmth as yep. well. And the warmth indicates the, you know, the alcohol content to some extent. And this is a 5.6% beer so and the, um, the actual IBUs is pretty low at 22 international bitter units so that's a measurement of how bitter yeah. it actually is so 22 is pretty much on the low end of the scale yeah it's a very drinkable beer so if you're at home and you're having this beer here I think you can agree with us that it's a very smooth drinking beer and for those that don't like there's many that have come on the tour or have drinking with us that don't that just say right off the hop they don't like dark beers you know, when we go out there, like, I don't like dark beers no matter what. But I think that this is a beer that I think, even if you're not a dark beer drinker, it's so low IBUs. It's so timid. It's just, and it's got that banana bread taste, which kind of mm -hmm. adds, like, a really sweet flavor to it. It's very unique. Yeah, yeah. so I think people would, would be okay with this. I, I think, I think like so. It. I think yeah. so. Um, you know, it's, it's relatively creamy, which is also a characteristic uh, of this beer. I think that um, if you've had one of these, you probably wouldn't make it what I would call a session beer, a beer that you might like to have more than one of. I, th I think, you know, a nice good pint to this is, is probably sufficient. Yeah, well, and, and that's that's a unique. George brings up session ale, and session ale's kind of a British term for the ales you would drink in the day that were like 3%. You know what's funny about session ales is judges used to like, would, would dismiss court, and they would go and they would have a session ale. <laughs> And then they'd all reconvene because it was so low percentage. It wasn't. Uh, right. It wasn't like you it's know, probably safer than the water. <laughs> it, yeah, it was. <laughs> oh, and, that, and so you're right. This is definitely not a session ale. I think this is a an ale where uh, uh, you're going to come out, have a drink, and you're going to be like, "Ooh, that was a." Uh, there you go. There's five point six right in me. Right. You, know? you, you may have noticed we're swirling the beer in our glass. Uh, what that does, it helps bring out some of the extra flavor because you're adding a little bit of oxygen. Uh, to the to the beer and that helps uh, um, release yeah. some of those flavors that are trapped in there sometimes. Yeah. So what's your what's your verdict, uh, George? What do you think about it? What's your what's your notes? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, this is a I think it's a very good example. It's a unique type of beer. Whenever you you go down the road of you know uh, extra 
types of flavors and things like that. It's always a bit of a, an experiment. I, I'd say this is an ex- a successful experiment. Awesome, yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you, I think. It's, 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 I could drink this beer a lot, you know what I mean? Like, it's a beer that could become a beer that's, like, in my repertoire of, of beers to drink. I like the sweetness. I like the nuttiness to it. Mm-hmm. And you're right on the spice on the tongue. I really like that. And yeah. that comes from, I think we were reading, it comes from the Belgian yeasts. Yes, that yes, they use, that's right. right. Yeah. Well, I think another thing, too, when you when you look at uh, beers of this nature, you, you, you think about uh, some of the other stouts and, and beers that are, you know, like an oatmeal stout. You think of them as breakfast mm. beers. So, mm. you know, this is... You know, we're still in the morning here, so <laughs> I, I'd say that, you know, this qualifies as a breakfast beer. That's right. Well, George gave it away. We're shooting very early in the morning, which is always appreciated as a beer drinker. And you're right. It's like a breakfast beer. So, uh, well, that's great, George. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a success. Enjoy your hard knocks, everybody. And, uh, and uh, yeah, school. School. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. We've come back here to one of the most hidden gems of Lethbridge as far as decks are concerned. I love this deck out here at Sisters uh, Pub and Grill. And with us right now is uh, Greg Moody, the head chef here at Sisters Pub and Grill. Greg, how you doing today? Good, thanks, Roy. Awesome, yeah. man. So we got a few questions for you, if you don't mind. George, you want to lead us sure, off? Sure, sure. Greg, Sisters have been around for a while. Uh, how did how did Sisters get started as a, as a business? We uh, we have been around a while. I've been here. I've been here for eight and a half years now. Wow! But uh, back in November, we celebrated ten year anniversary. <laughs> there are many of you who will remember uh, rides. Yes, when this oh, yeah. was rides. <laughs> yep. Some so, of the decor uh, harkens back to that. Some of the decor, uh, yeah, is uh, we retain some of that yeah. uh, for sure. So the the sisters, there are actually three sisters who got together and and bought this place okay many of you uh, who might know that this used to be the original home of uh, mcfadden honda right yes I so it that. was a car dealership and service place right hence the car theme that we kind of retained mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and you guys have done amazing things with this place like for example i know that back room you have businesses come in the back room they can rent out that space it's, it's kind of cool it's an interesting little space that's uh <laughs> Very organically uh, put together, yeah. so it's not one big room. Uh, yeah. So, would you say that's something that that sets uh, sisters apart from other businesses? Just the you know the decor and you know having a, a room like that and you know some photos and things that you know uh, go back to the history of certainly. The yeah, there, there's a lot of uniqueness in the in the in the space mm-hmm. for sure. Right. So, Greg, what Let's would see. be a, an interesting, unique story about sisters? Like something that you think you know when I think of sisters, I think of on the menu side, which is my end of things, yeah. <laughs> we have evolved into doing most things in-house. We smoke our own brisket, and uh, we try to support the uh, local producers. Even now with, with COVID, you know, we're uh, bring, getting in contact with local farmers and such yeah. to, uh, you know, make it easier. Yeah. And fresher. It's like that from the farm to table yeah. thing. It's really taking off, which is amazing because it sources local produce. Well, our le- our, our right? lettuce is coming from Coaldale. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, our tomatoes are coming from Medicine Hat. So That's awesome. Instead of California, thousands, <laughs> of, thousands of kilometers away. Yep. And our meat is locally sourced. And yes. And our, our bakery out in uh, uh, Fort McLeod does wonderful work. See, that's so, just, uh, that's excellent. Yeah, that must excite you. As and a we're chef. doing the same with yeah. the, with uh, some of our beers. That's right. Too. Yeah, we're bringing in in local local mm-hmm. producers like Spectrum and uh, and uh, yes, Stronghold from yeah, so from Fort McLeod. Yeah, yeah, from Fort McLeod and Fernie, and so we're doing our best not in that way. Yeah. That's awesome, Greg. Thanks That's fun. awesome, Greg. Yeah. Well, well, Greg, thank you so much, man. Keep up the amazing work in the kitchen and, and here at Sisters Pub and Grill. Uh, we really appreciate your time. It's my pleasure. My yeah. pleasure. It's awesome. Greg. Yeah. Thanks, George. Now I'm standing in front of the Henderson and Downer block. This building behind me was built in 1895 by William Henderson and Frederick Downer. Now the name Henderson may sound familiar because that is Mayor William Henderson, who also built other buildings in town, including the original Lethbridge Hotel and a duplex that he and his family lived in on 7th Avenue South. Henderson and Downer were partners for quite a few years, and this was one of the buildings they constructed. 
Now, when this building was first constructed, it was as office buildings and for use as office space. But they wanted to make it into a hotel, so they expanded it and turned it into the Coldale Hotel. Now, one of the things we like to do is try to confuse you as much as possible in history. Because as you listen to my tour today, I'm going to actually talk about two different Coldale hotels, both within a block of each other. So there were actually two Coldale hotels in Lethbridge and a Coldale hotel in Coldale, just to confuse you even more. When this was operating as the Coldale Hotel, they wanted to get a liquor license, but couldn't. So instead, they turned it back into office building, office space, and that's when the other Coldale Hotel took the name and opened just a block down. Now, this building has a bit of an interesting story. As a building that is 125 years old, you might imagine a few things have happened here. And it's also the site of the 1907 riot. Now, yes, Lethbridge did have a riot in 1907, but it might not be the type of riot you're expecting. This riot happened on Christmas Day. And I'm going to give you the story as it's given in the Lethbridge Herald, and then we'll talk a bit about it. So it is Christmas Eve, 1907. A man named Harry Smith has been visiting a lot of restaurants downtown. He goes into a Chinese restaurant in the Henderson and Downer block when he gets into a fight with the Chinese waiter. Another waiter grabs a hammer and hits Harry Smith over the head. Rumor gets around town that Harry Smith has been killed, so the next day on Christmas Day, 500 men come down to this building, destroy the Chinese restaurant, are looking to destroy other Chinese businesses when Mayor Galbert, the Mounted Police and the City Police all show up and they put an end to the riot. Following the riot, only two men are charged um, for any activity during the riot, and those are the two Chinese waiters who are charged with assault on Harry Smith. Now you might find a few problems with that story, and in fact there are other versions that tell a very different story. One of my favorite is actually titled, The Christmas the Cowboys of Lethbridge Want Berserk. And it tells a very different story. I could never figure out you know, how exactly a riot got ended that quickly, or why a waiter had a hammer. And this one tells a different story. You might have been wondering why Harry Smith had been visiting a lot of restaurants on Christmas Eve. In this version, it's because he's drunk. He's actually going to a restaurant, getting into fights, getting kicked out. In fact, when he comes to this restaurant, he is so drunk, he's actually said to be shooting tomato cans off the wall of the restaurant. So you can see why the waiters were trying to get rid of him. As I said, I could never understand why a waiter had a hammer. In this version, they don't. It's actually a knife and not the sharp end. They use the wooden end to escort Harry Smith out of the building. But the next day, 500 people do come downtown and are wrecking the business and causing a riot. But this time, when the Mounted Police, Mayor Galworth and the City Police show up, they actually bring a wagon with them to arrest people. And they have to take people and throw them into the wagon. And they can't figure out why everybody fits into the wagon until they realize that up front, the poor driver is trying to hold the horses and hold people in, and people are actually climbing out over him. So we will never know if it's actually 500 people or if 100 people were each arrested five times or what was actually happening. In this version, at the end of the story, they actually apologize to the Chinese business owner, clean up the restaurant the best they can, and then everyone finally goes home two very different versions that tell the same story. Now, which one do you like better? Most people like the second one better. Which one's true? I don't know. The problem with the second one, it was written by somebody who writes a lot of history, but who we can't always trust. It was written by Anonymous, which you know makes us wonder if that person actually knew more than they wanted to say, but didn't put their name on it, or if they made a lot of it up. But this is where, in 1907, the Christmas Day riot occurred when the Chinese businesses and people of Lethbridge were attacked. Welcome to our next stop. We're here at Dylan's Piggyback and we've got a very special beer here chosen by Dylan himself. Uh, and so we're drinking Zero Issues Brewing's Nemesis IPA. And it's an IPA. We were discussing the actual inter international bitter units on it and we said we're going to have to taste it to find out because it's not mentioned anywhere. But this brewery is run by two brothers. Uh, about three years ago, it was July of 2017, two brothers formulated this brewery and they said they were just love for beer and passion. And they say on their website, they have a nemesis for beer and IPAs and they're coming forward with uh, some great stuff here. So we're going to sample this. We're going to talk a bit about it. Dylan was eager. He poured his a little 
little quickly to get her going. It's over there. He's got it. He's got it. So so uh, let's let's dive let's, into this, fellas. Do this. Yeah, one, this. Of, one of the things this is where I mentioned the uh, IBUs International Bitter Units. They're not mentioned uh, with any of the promotional material. But what is mentioned is really is the uh, is the alcohol. This is a six point eight, so it's labeled as a strong beer. So um, you know we'll we'll be careful with this one. <laughs> But again, as Dylan just suggested, a slow pour is in order because yeah. it's it's fairly carbonated, and we haven't talked about carbonation yet in any of our beers. But you know, carbonation is you know yeah. one of the things when you you do sort of the light check, looking at the appearance. If you see a lot of bubbles, especially small bubbles, that's a really nice sign. And you see that picked yeah. up actually in the head of the beer as well. So you can see even with a slow pour, I still got quite a bit of head on this beer. Yeah. Let's well, and we can who, who pours beer all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh wow! Like to see who nice pours beers all the time. Good job, Dylan. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's some of the beers are very specific on how they're to be poured. Yeah. There are definitely beers in the cooler. This is one of them that are super sensitive to getting an extra large head on it. So, I've definitely poured a lot of each one of these beers, and there are certain ones you have to be super careful of. Otherwise, it just doesn't pour quite right. Yeah, yeah. And and at a six point eight percent too. Uh, being being you know a higher percentage, we we can assume that the that the bitter units are quite high on this one. I think we can make that assumption, can we? Yeah, you can make that assumption. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Let's do the nose first. It's uh, fruity, citrusy. Yeah, quite fruity. So you can really pick that off. They have the pi- They have pineapple like pineapple notes in this, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's good. Oh yeah. Like the old. What was this? Do you remember this from the old yeah. science classes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Definitely um, balanced. The IBUs are high, I and mean, you can taste the yes. You can taste the bitter with it, but you also get the balance of the big fruitiness of it. It's pretty juicy. Yeah. It uh, it balances out nice, especially with that six point eight percent alcohol. Some of these yeah. beers hide it quite well. This would be one of them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, Some it's, of them it just tastes like alcohol. <laughs> like there's, it's there's quite a bit of malt in this one, so <laughs> yeah. you know you do get that sweetness too, which is a little bit unusual for an IPA. You usually get a lot more influence of the hops so that's a like like you said yeah. it's quite a balance there yeah. well even with this fusion like what's your guess ibu dylan like what what's your, what would be your guess on this i don't really know i don't follow ibus very much i think like for me i don't know like i'm thinking high 80s i, I was thinking around 80 yeah yeah, yeah. I, I stopped reading ibus on cans and go by taste and yeah that's yeah. well that's just, a smart way yeah. everything we sell here is basically a hand sale we don't really keep an accurate beer menu because it varies day by day mm-hmm. when i Wander into Andrew Hilton and find something that I want to buy, and then I buy it. <laughs> and then it's here. So we've created a business right now, obviously, COVID that we haven't been able to do, but created a business around it where we have a lot of our customers come in and they just know, like, just come meet me at the beer cooler so we can talk about what we have. Yeah. And be able to yeah. hand sell a beer is better because you can really get to what people like. If yeah. they just like, hey, I'll just grab that purple can, they're probably not going to be that happy <laughs> without having a conversation, especially for some of these beers. Well, it's like, it's like buying a nice pair of shoes, right? It's Absolutely. like, come in, you come in. You, if you don't know what you want, they're going to sell you something you might not be happy with. It's the same with beer, right? It's like, you got to know what your style is, what your yeah. flavor yeah. is, right? Well, and, and, you know, back to the flavor, we talked about the fruitiness of it. So, you know, there's, there's some grapefruit in here, some mango, some mm-hmm. passion fruit. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm kind of um, parroting what, what the label says because I don't, I don't really know what passion fruit tastes like, but <laughs> it's in here. <laughs> and but it, you've got the the citrusy notes, so you know that really really emerges. And again, yeah. you know, as we've been doing in the past, give it a little bit of a swirl, get a little more oxygen in there. It it uh, you know really adds to the uh, to the uh, taste of the beer, especially since it's unfiltered. With the the beers being unfiltered, you'll see sediment sometimes in the beer, so you have to when you're pouring it keep that in mind. Or if you're pouring a a big IPA or something like that, and you see the last little bit coming out that has leaf, like it just look, basically looks like a little sludge. That's good. That's not a bad thing. That's awesome. So, so Dylan, tell us a bit about uh, outside of the amazing beer you serve. Like, what, 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 what's here? What, what's all going on in Dylan's right now? Doing a lot of delivery, a lot of takeout. Just going to be launching our patio right away. We just had some meetings with the city, so that will be happening. We'll be awesome. Licensed right out there. on the street. Yeah. It's going to be directly in front. We had. Uh, some things moved around the city, moved some things, so we have the space directly in front of our restaurants. So we'll be doing that. It'll be licensed shortly. Um, That's awesome. Looking so then, forward to that. We've been just over a year combined in this location. So it was Dylan's Burger and Deli here for oh, two years, and then Piggyback was 
piggyback retainery was in the other location for five. It's just been over a year that we've combined the two, so we're in our seventh year as piggyback. Yeah, that's awesome, and and I love the uh, I had the Guinness the Guinness bratwurst. Oh yeah, out there. that yeah. was delicious, man! Wow, oh, those Guinness beer breasts, yeah. Yeah, and they it say it's going to taste like beer. It tastes like beer. There's very few products that you order or buy that says, "Well, this is going to taste like beer." It doesn't really taste like beer. Uh, <laughs> the whole kitchen smells like beer when you're cooking. Those is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Something that people might not know that you know would find would find interesting. Like you've been here for yeah. a while. You've been downtown for a while. Yeah, we've seen a big cycle of downtown. Um, one of the best things we did was move in together here. So. That gives us the opportunity to do both the burgers, the patin, and the beer, where that was completely separate. Actually, when we had yeah. just a burger shop, we weren't even doing fries. We're doing something different. Um, so that combined everything together. Got a couple food trucks. So that's that's been a, something that I don't know if everybody knows about us. So we've been doing that for a few years now. So as, as um, Dylan, so what are you most proud of, of your, of your business and this location and you know how you do things? Everything we do is as much hand as made as possible. It's like our burgers, we grind our beef, we grind 30% bacon into our burgers, so all our burgers are handmade with 30% bacon ground into it. That's why they're addicted. That's why. <laughs> yeah, that's why they taste like uh, bacon and salt. Yeah. <laughs> it's delicious. It's delicious. Obviously cut potatoes and buy those locally. And then our beer menu generally is anywhere between 35 and 50 Alberta Craft. It's also usually like 12 to 14 brewers. So some will have four or five. Some will only have one or two of their selections. Nice. Excellent. Dylan, much appreciation for your business and for you having us here. Thank you so much. Yeah, you got any thanks. final words for the camera and the people? Come see us. Patio time. Yeah. Patio time. Yeah, really? really? That's exactly it. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Standing in front of the Whitney block. This building was built in 1907 by DJ Whitney and has been standing here on 3rd Avenue South, which was Red Path, for the past 113 years. The building has had multiple uses. Around 1909, one of the people who lived in this building was actually a C.E. Brower, Charles Brower. He was an entrepreneur who owned a messenger service, he owned a second-hand store, and he owned a boarding house here in the Whitney block. Now what might make Brower a little different than most of our stories is he was actually a black entrepreneur who lived in Lethbridge between 1909 and 1920. And around 1920 he left Lethbridge and he moved to Calgary. There's a whole much more to his story but this building has a lot of other stories so I'm going to move on to some of those as well. This building has had multiple uses. It was an office building, it had a restaurant as well, it had the boarding house and it turned into a hotel. Now when I earlier was speaking about the um, building that's now the Metcalf Block, the Club Cigar Store building, I called that the Coldale Hotel. This too was the Coldale Hotel and served as both the Coldale Hotel and then the Lincoln Hotel. Another feature that this building had over the years is this is actually the site of one of the Alberta government liquor stores. And if you actually look at pictures from the Second World War, there's an amazing picture outside the Whitney building during the war years. As many of you might know, we actually had rationing during the Second World War, where you had a ration book that you had to use in order to get gas, meat, sugar, things like that. But one of the other things they had to ration was alcohol. And there was actually beer shortages during the Second World War. So following one of the beer shortages, there was actually a lineup outside the Whitney Block, which went down the uh, sidewalk and around the corner. And they actually had a police officer in the picture, so standing there making sure that the lineup moved in the way it was supposed to, as people actually lined up for rationed beer. This building served, um, was, as I said, the Lincoln Hotel, and then was developed in the 1970s into the Harvester Restaurant. This building has stayed mostly the same over the years. One thing, though, has changed. If you look at old pictures of this building, it actually had Whitney on the top of the building, and that uh, Whitney Block sign has uh, was taken down about the 1970s. Um, unfortunately, we ha don't have that anymore, but it was a beautiful addition to this building when it was there. Now, you will hear all kinds of stories about this building. I know there are ghost stories attached to this building, and I think I have some of the reasons they might be. One of my more interesting stories, when this was a hotel, one of the gentlemen living here had asthma, or staying here had asthma, and he had taken some medication for his asthma, so he was trying to sleep during the night. The windows used to be only about 20 inches off the ground and what they think happened is he went to open the window at night to get some fresh air in so he could breathe better but with the very low sill he actually fell out the window and died falling out of this building 
um, when he was staying here overnight. Well, hello everybody. Uh, we're at our next stop here at the Owl Acoustic Lounge. Uh, the Owl Acoustic Lounge, if you haven't been here, uh, is a massive supporter of live music in our community. Also a big supporter of the art scene in Lethbridge and also a big community supporter in the downtown and also just generally in the Lethbridge community. So it's great to be here to sample a beer. Um, I really enjoy this space, especially their open mic comedy nights. I'm really a big fan of the open mic comedy nights here. Uh, it's gotten many local comedians started in this community, so I really appreciate it. And we have a, a, one of my favorite breweries in Southern Alberta, which is even more exciting. We have the Old Man River Brewing Company. Uh, it formulated in July of 2017, so almost three years. It's in Lundbrick, um, just on your way to Fernie. If you're going out towards Fernie by Pincher Creek, you got this beautiful little brewery called Old Man River Brewing. Uh, you go in there, the owner, Adam, is just a great guy. If you ask him politely, I think he'll even give you a tour of his, of his, he's very proud of his operation as he should be. He converted a building into kind of a brewery. And uh, he has for us today provided um, here at the Owl, the Blind Canyon Blonde, uh, it's citrus blonde ale so I think we can understand we're gonna get into citrusy so if you ever go out you're on your way to Fernie or you're on your way to Pincher Creek or you're out that way stop by Old Man River Brewing Company stop in grab a growler uh, they have great uh, smokies as well so it's a really cool place so George yes let's give this uh, this a try so right. it, uh, we'll see if it lives up to your uh, your uh, promo here, <laughs> I promise it will okay let's well you can this. already smell the citrusy yes. I'm just you know what excites me about Old Man River Brewing? He takes uh, Belgian recipes and he really emulates uh, Belgian beers. So like the doubles, the triples, like he's, and he even had a quadruple and it's just brilliant. He, he's a brilliant brewer in my opinion. So shout out to Adam and uh, here we are. Here so. we are, cheers. So again, as we often do, is we, we look at the color of the beer and it's right in the, in the middle of the style category, yeah, sort of a, a Kind of a dark blonde, uh, mild gold color. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's really nice. It's got a nice nice white head on it, which is also um, part of the style. And as as we often do, to try and get a little bit more uh, flavor into the beer, a little oxygen, Ooh. just give it a little bit of a swirl, and then we'll give it the old yeah. uh, aroma test. That's got a really potent aroma. Oh, yeah. I like it. You can smell that. You can. And I think one of the things um, that you can smell right off the top is grapefruit which is yeah. one, of, one of the citrus fruits. So and I think that's yeah. that's one of the characteristics that they, they talk about for the beer. I think you're right, George. And, you know, in it too, you it, right away, it's just it's citrus, grapefruit. It, it oh, it's yeah. just sticks out to you. Yeah. But it's a very smooth beer. Mm -hmm. Like I'm actually, and, and you can see, you can see right through it. It's, oh, it's yeah. clear. Yeah, it's clear. And it's for there. a Blondale, in my opinion, I think it's got a bit more of a kick to it than most Blondales I'm familiar Well, it's with. a 5%, so it's alcohol-wise, it's, you know, it's right at, right on the money. You know, they can vary, you know, um, a percent or two either direction. But, um, you know, this one's right in, the, right in the middle of the road. So I think that's a, that's a very good sign. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The, you know, the style characteristics indicate that, uh, you know, this, this is, you know, really true to the style. Of, you know, the blonde nails yeah. that, you were, that you were talking about earlier and, and the citrus fruit. So once you take a drink and, you know, you, you do a bit of a, a swirl to, you know, get the full, yeah. the full taste of the beer. You know, it's a, it's a medium body beer. It's got a really dry finish, mm. uh, which is, you know, it's nice. And you, in the finish of that beer, you, you taste a lot more of that citrus. So you've had yeah. a little bit, your taste buds have had a bit more of a chance to get used to that. Yeah, and it lingers into your next sip, which is really nice. So it kind of, you, this one flows really well. You want to keep drinking it. So mm -hmm. on a hot summer day on a deck somewhere, this beer would oh, fly. Yeah. It would just go down. Yeah. <laughs> well, th this is this is one of the, the beers that, uh, you know, if you're talking to a bunch of beer aficionados, they'd call it a lawnmower beer because, you know, after you've, before or after, or even during, I guess, when you're mowing your lawn, you know, on a hot summer day, 
This is a real thirst quencher. <laughs> exactly. Put it in one of those backpacks you used to have, George, with yeah, the uh, suction yeah. straws. Back. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Just go for it. Well, this has been a great beer. Uh, quick thoughts on it, George. Uh, what, what do you think? Would you drink this again? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is a great beer. I'll, I might pick some up for the weekend. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think I share the same sentiment. Yeah. So we just want to thank uh, the owner here, Steve Ford, uh, for allowing us in here to sample this beer. And uh, yeah, cheers, everyone. Cheers. Enjoy it. All right, here we are at the Owl Acoustic Lounge with owner Steve Ford, and we're going to ask him a few questions. So, George, kick us off with some. All right. You're thanks. in the hot seat. Yeah, Steve, I haven't <laughs> met you before, so it's great, great to meet you today. You know, we've been asking uh, on on these tours how how you came up, how the owners uh, came about starting their businesses in the downtown, and you know, so w what got your start here? Um, well, a lot of a lot of luck and a lot of help, really. Like um, myself and uh, my business partner Mel Dominguez, we it was actually right around uh, this time ten years ago. Actually, ten years. wow. Um, we were working at another place uh, just around the corner called Hanotic, and we kind of. Uh, saw the writing on the wall at that place and it, it talked about maybe trying to open our own place at one point mm -hmm. and then it just so happened that uh, the landlord there uh, was also the landlord for this building Pete Farino mm -hmm. and um, we uh, he liked us and kind of let us pitch our idea to him and he liked it and thought it was uh, something so he he took a chance on us so that's uh, without him um, there's no way we'd have been yeah. going to be honest interesting so. so so what sets you apart from from other businesses in the in the downtown uh well, we're kind of we're sort of the the black sheep a little a little bit in a lot of ways um <laughs> we're a, kind of a, a sort of a niche kind of place right so it's it's all about art like an art is a very subjective term i would say like beer is art so, um, uh, music is art uh painting art obviously mm -hmm. comedy sure, art sure. So we kind of focus on the different aspects of, of what that is and try to uh, integrate all of it and sort of be a sort of a community hub as best we can and, mm -hmm. and sort of facilitate a, like a, a garden to grow more art, oh, basically. Yeah. Incubator of some sort exactly. as well. Yeah. Ooh, tough word, right? <laughs> well, and, and, oh, yeah. And, <laughs> Sorry about that. Steve, you've done an excellent job here, especially with the art. I bet you you have a story for almost many of the things that are in here. You could probably talk for days. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just amazing. So what would you like you know, the audience to know about the owl? Uh, well, uh, especially right now, it's uh, we're, we're reopening and we're, we're going about it the right way to like, um, we've set up our social distancing and um, we've got all of our lines on the floor, plexiglass, we've got dividers. Uh, we're doing it the right way. Like um, we're starting to reintegrate music shows now too, so awesome. uh, but we're just sticking to instrumental because that's the, the mm -hmm. recommendations right now. So. Um, and we're doing delivery and takeout. I'm actually doing the deliveries myself <laughs> oh. right now. That's uh, the life of a, <laughs> of a business owner, right? Yeah. So you learn a little bit of everything. So. Great. So is your menu online then, Steve? Can people access your menu? Yes. Oh, and cool. so even within the, the restaurant, now we're encouraging people to use their phone and look up through the uh, website, right. acousticlounge.ca. You find the menu on there and... Um, going as paperless as we possibly up here what would you you've been here 10 years what would you be most proud of in, in that 10 years uh honestly for me it's uh i'm more so a, a music guy and it's it's watching some of the the younger musicians like there's kids because yeah. we're allowed minors here right so i've seen kids that have been coming here when they were like 14 and 15 and now they're yeah. grown and they've got these incredible bands yeah, and like awesome. just kind of seeing them to develop that way that's the the coolest thing for me so that's great. cool great. and now they're some of them are my friends which is i'm, <laughs> I'm the weird old guy <laughs> great thank you very much steve no thank, thank you, you steve right on so here we are outside andrew hilton now, there are some things you need to know about Lethbridge if you want to understand our beer and alcohol past. A couple of years ago, they were trying to save the brewery up in Calgary. And one of the things they were saying is it's the oldest brewery, to ever, the first brewery ever built in Alberta. We down in Lethbridge weren't quite sure how to respond to that because we really wanted them to save their brewery. But we know that the first brewery ever built in what is now Alberta or Saskatchewan was actually here in Lethbridge. It was actually built by a man named Joseph Knoll, and it was down in the River Valley. And he made what was called hot beer. Now, the beer was made in 10 days. It wasn't pasteurized. It wasn't sediment-free. But considering the first two deaths down in the little Cobank settlement were actually from typhoid from the water, 
the beer was actually probably your safer choice. And they made a 4% beer down there. Um, and actually, we had breweries from 1883 time period up until the 1990s. And then now, of course, we have new breweries today. And Lethbridge has always liked its beer and its alcohol. In 1901, the uh, Fritzig Brewery, the sixth brewery, the Lethbridge Brewery started. And it would have been just over to our left on First Avenue and Second Avenue there off of Scenic Drive. That beer had to deal with the fact that Prohibition came to Alberta in 1916. In 1915, they held a vote to see whether or not the people of Alberta wanted to get rid of alcohol. In Lethbridge, we decided we wanted to keep our alcohol. We were the only city in the province who said, please let us keep our alcohol. And we actually voted that way twice during Prohibition, but the rest of the province outvoted us and we had to give up our alcohol. Well, at least legally had to give up our alcohol. Lethbridge became known as quite the bootlegging area during the Prohibition times. And in fact, one of the biggest bootleggers ever, Mark C. Rogers, was from Lethbridge. And it's reported that in two years of bootlegging, he made about $200,000 in the 1920s. So certainly, Lethbridge found a way to keep its alcohol, even when it wasn't legal. Now, we're standing here outside Andrew Hilton. This building is a relatively new building. What was here prior to that was actually the second A&W in Lethbridge. The A&W opened here in the 1960s, and it was in a prime spot. 3rd Avenue was actually Highway 3, and in the 1960s, Scenic Drive was completed. And so you can imagine this corner had a lot of action, a lot of traffic, and they built an A&W here. The first A&W was actually where the 7-Eleven is on Mayor McGrath Drive at the Sandman Inn. And there was, when that one closed, they moved the A&W a little further down Mayor McGrath Drive. So if you were a young person back in those days, in the 1960s, 1970s, you may remember doing the dub. And what I've been told, that was the, what you would do is you would drive your car up and down 3rd Avenue and Mammograph Drive between the two A&Ws, and that was called doing the dump. So, of course, Lethbridge liked its alcohol, but there is another vice, actually two more vices Lethbridge was known for. In the early 1900s, some of the largest gambling raids in Alberta history were here in Lethbridge, and then there was also the Red Light District. Now, I'm assuming if you are joining us on a beer and history tour, you're not easy to offend, so I hope this will not be offensive to you. But a Calgary reporter actually described Lethbridge this way. He said the coolies were formed by men humping their way to Lethbridge. Now, not what science tells you, I am sure. But one of the things Lethbridge was renowned for in the pre-first world or pre-second world war period was actually its red light district. In fact, red light district was said to be our number one tourist attraction prior to the 1940s. And Lethbridge had a large red light district. The area started in the River Valley and then around 1908 actually moved up to the point. The point was a triangular piece of the coolies upon which several large brothels were constructed. It was a little bit outside the main business district, but it was in a very prominent spot on a coolie just beside the high level bridge. So there was no way as you entered or left Lethbridge that you did not know what that area of town was. And one of the ways that our city fathers actually decided to try to address the situation was that they made the, the road into the red light district, into the point, the most lit place in Lethbridge, so there were bright lights, so that if you went down to the red light district, your neighbors and everybody would know because it was a very well lit area, but it didn't stop many people from going there. Now, if you're trying to figure out where the point is, the point stayed there, that red light district till about 1920, and then it moved into another area of Lethbridge. And that area was sort of empty for decades. Um, it was part of Marshall Auto Wreckers for a long time. And then in the 1970s, they decided to build a hotel where the old red light district used to be. I won't tell you the name, but hopefully you can guess.
Hi, I'm Kyle with Andrew Hilton Wine and Spirits. Uh, we're actually the oldest independent liquor store in Canada now. We've been here since 1985, and we're more than just a wine store. We actually have a really amazing craft beer program as well, uh, with me driving up to Calgary to get some really interesting exclusive beers from Establishment 88 Cabin and SYC. Um, our beer program has really changed the last few years uh, between our growler station, our build your own four pack station, and now with our online beer tastings. Uh, our commitment to supporting kind of local Alberta breweries has never been stronger. Uh, the ability to have interesting, unique things that nobody else in town really has access to unless, unless they want to take their whole Saturday drive to Calgary every week uh, is it gives us just incredible things. Like this weekend, we're driving up to Calgary to get some new stuff from Cabin because they've got a brand new Australian IPA and a brand new Australian Pilsner. And as far as I know, we're the only people south of Calgary that are going to have it at all. And that's not just this week. That's every week, which has given us a really interesting niche in the marketplace because, you know, being... As old as we are, we don't have a walk-in fridge. We still have rollers. But I kind of like that we have the rollers because it gives us the opportunity to have a smaller, more curated selection that, you know, I always know what's fresh, what's not, what needs to move on. And we always have new homes for new beers, and I really like that aspect of it. On Wednesday nights, we started doing an online beer tasting, uh, and we sell them as a set of four mixed beers uh, from either a single brewery where we'll have like the brewmaster of the brewery on or the owner of the brewery on, or we'll have uh, either a local home brewer or somebody who runs a, uh, a beer website on to talk about the beers with us. And those have been a lot of fun. Um, they're a huge seller for us, and the online aspect of it allows us to reach people from not just in Lethbridge, but all across southern Alberta. And looking at some of our social media aspects, we have live viewers of even places in the U.S. and all across Canada. Um, being able to do that is just a completely different aspect that we would have never even considered before the pandemic and has been just so much fun. Being able to, you know, stand here where I'm standing now and have a conversation with like the head brewer from 88 or establishment or the guy who runs the Lambic Wiki or, you know, uh, Mark Whitehead, who's now moved away, but was, I think, the most successful home brewer that Lethbridge has ever had. These give us a, an ability to talk about beer and approach beer from a really interesting perspective that we never would have been able to before. Um, and they've been so much fun for us to do. I think what really sets us apart is two things. Um, one, we do have access to some really exclusive products, either through brokered wines or whiskeys that we pre-order months ahead or wines that we assist in the importation of so that you know no one else really has them. Uh, but beyond that is the fact that we have a really small and really professional full-time staff. You know, in addition to myself, we have Devin, who is a Wine and Spirits Education Trust Level 3 uh, wine professional. We have Nigel, who is a BJCP certified beer judge. Uh, right down to Mike and Corey, who have both been with me for at least five years. You know, you come in and you ask a question about a wine or you ask a question about a beer or you ask a question about Pisco, uh, and you're going to get a real answer. Uh, and I don't think there's really anywhere else in town that can offer that right now. And if there's one thing I'm proud of, it's my people. That's unquestionably what I'm proud of most. standing on 2nd Avenue South in front of the old fire hall. This building was actually the second fire hall built in Lethbridge, but it was built on the exact same spot as the original 1891 fire hall. And what they did is they actually used a number of bricks from that older fire hall and then built this expanded and new building here on site. Now we call this number one fire hall, but when it was built, it was actually much more than a fire hall. Its original name is the municipal building because this fire hall was actually town offices, city offices, as well as the police station and the fire station. And it remained municipal offices until 1917 when City Hall moved off to a new site and the police moved off to a new site. From 1917 until the 1970s, this was only a fire station. Now, because the police were in here, there was also something kind of unique in the basement and that is actually old jail cells. Those were used by the police in those nine years that they were in the building. Now there are stories about this building, stories that I don't think are at all true. One story I've been told is that Al Capone was actually arrested here in Lethbridge and was kept as a prisoner down there in those jail cells. That is absolutely not true. Not only is it the wrong time period, Al Capone was after 1917, 
but Al Capone did not come to Lethbridge and did not get arrested in Lethbridge. Trust me, if I knew Al Capone had actually been arrested in Lethbridge, I would have written about it and you would all know about it. It's not a secret. The other story I've been told about this building is that somebody was executed in the building. There's actually a story that somebody was hung from the bell tower. Not true at all. There's only actually ever been one execution within what is now the city of Lethbridge. That was actually someone who murdered his, uh, his girlfriend's husband. I don't know about you, but you're not supposed to have a boyfriend and a husband at the same time. They tend to cause problems. But Walzo Tobiter did murder his girlfriend's husband, and he was executed for it. But he was actually, his hanging took place where Fritzig Pool is today, in the Civic Center around City Hall. Now, this building, as the fire hall, was more than just a fire station as we see it today. One of the things is that the people who worked here, the firefighters and their families, actually lived in the building. The other thing, when you think back to 1908, they were using horses as well as trucks for firefighting and so horses would have been living here at those days in those days as well now in some ways our fire department was ahead of the game we were the first fire department in canada to put roto lights on our fire trucks and so when you see the flashing lights on the fire trucks to this very day just know that lethbridge was ahead of the game and we were the first place in canada to attach those to fire trucks in the 1920s the firefighters from this very station actually came to the help, the aid of the police in 1960. In the fall of 1960, we had a bit of a street riot, a street ruckus here on 2nd Avenue South, right outside of Hungarian Hall. There was a wedding happening here in Hungarian Hall, and many of the people who were visitors there had recently come from Hungary. And there they had different liquor laws, and more open liquor laws where you could drink on the street, etc. So when they came out of the wedding and started to drink on the street, something they were quite accustomed to, that actually broke the laws of Lethbridge and Canada, and the police were called. When the police arrived, a street fight started between the wedding goers and the police. A police car was destroyed, 13 people were arrested, bricks and rocks were thrown, and it was very much a difficult time. In the end, two groups came to the assistance of the police and helped the police win this street fight. One were Indigenous people in downtown Lethbridge who came and fought on behalf of the police, and the other was actually the firefighters who brought out their uh, hoses and actually used water to stop the fight. After the fight, they told the police, though, that they weren't going to do that anymore, and they told the police they had to buy their own water cannon and deal with issues on their own without the firefighters coming to their rescue. Now, as we stand here on 2nd Avenue South, we're also close to what we call Chinatown. Now today Chinatown is only part of a street. There are several buildings still there between 4th and 3rd Street. But at one time Chinatown was much larger. It would have been four square blocks between 1st Avenue and 3rd Avenue, 4th Street and the Coolies. And it was quite a large area of town. And you might always wonder how did Chinatown get created? What happened to make it? Well we can tell the story through the story of Kwong Sang, a business man here in Lethbridge. In 1909, Kwong Sang built, built this building next to us, which is now the antique store, as a restaurant called the Fashion Cafe. And he operated from this restaurant for about a year or so. And then because of the anti-Asian sentiment in Lethbridge, the city of Lethbridge actually brought in a bylaw that actually in some ways created Chinatown. The bylaw sounds quite innocuous. It's bylaw 89 and it's a bylaw about laundries. And it was said that they wanted to have all of the laundries in Lethbridge in one area for health and safety to make sure water use, etc. But it became very clear that it was the Chinese laundries and the Chinese businesses that they wanted moved. And what happened with Kwong Sang's case is he actually built a second building further down in what is Chinatown and moved his business there. And what happened is many of the Chinese businesses moved into that area of town both for their own safety, but also because that was part of the bylaw and thus Chinatown was created.
day, everyone. We're down here downtown in front of the old fire hall um, at Bavaru Catering with our good friend Alejandro de Villa. De Villa. And it's me and George Cool. So, George, I'll pass it. We got some questions for Alejandro. So, George. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, Alejandro, it's uh, it's nice to see you again. Uh, it's been Thanks. it's been a while, and you know a lot of people might not necessarily know about Bavru. So, can you tell us a little bit about your business? Absolutely. Well, how you got started and that kind of thing. Perfect. Yeah. So, thank you, everyone, for having me today. Uh, our Bavru started four years ago, and we basically are uh, catering the focus on international cuisine. We like to bring people that experience, you know, of a different country, different experience, you know, try different flavors. So that's our business. So, you know, the international flair, that's one thing that sets you apart. Are there other things that, that set you apart for, from other businesses downtown? Yes, I think uh, what set us apart is, you know, I guess we are very visual. We like to, like, everything looks different and nice. I guess everything goes through your eyes first. So we are very detailed with that. We, we enjoy, you know, charismatic people around our services and yeah I think that's something that set us apart. So have you got any unique stories about either Bavru or things that you've learned you know with your your time with the, the building and this space? Yeah you know I guess a lot of people they are very sometimes uh, surprised of the building there's many people in town that they haven't even been inside mm -hmm. so when we were doing you know the the um, the brunches, we have many people coming and they were so excited to see the, the space. And I remember there was a gentleman who came and said, oh, you know, my my grandfather helped building this. And oh, he has wow. a picture that's in his cool. house and he was <laughs> telling us stories. So oh, that's that pretty was pretty cool. unique. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's really cool. Um, so what would you like people to, to take away from this interview? Like, what would you like people to know about Bavaru? Uh, so, you know, uh, there's many great businesses in town, so I would say, you know, give us all a try, come and get to know us, uh, you will have a different experience on each of us, and help us spread the word, I guess the best marketing tool is word of mouth, so come try us and help us spread the word. Awesome. Great. So just, just to wrap up, one, one final question, what would you be most proud of as, as Bavru and, and your business? Uh, well, I remember, you know, five years, well, four years ago, people were a bit hesitant of trying new things, trying new <laughs> flavors, and that was a challenge at the beginning for me, because, you know, I was hoping in weddings to do great menus and, you yeah. know, fancy stuff, <laughs> and sometimes people, they just wanted mashed potato and roast beef, and, <laughs> but slowly during the years, yeah, you know, I've noticed good. people are so willing to try new things, and yeah. once they've tried our food, they just, you know, trust us and let us surprise them and that's a great yeah. feeling well, and you have that uh, phenomenal taco bar yes that you come up and you pick everything and uh, george didn't you have that at your uh, yeah, retirement, retirement party, party yeah, yeah. And it was fa it's fantastic yeah. so that's exactly. pretty cool man yeah. awesome alejandro that's great yeah so alejandro tell us about this delicious popcorn absolutely so we're getting ready for all of you guys a uh, popcorn kit and that means that you will have a, a box with different flavors, uh, different popcorn flavors, and yeah, we really hope you enjoy this and give us your feedback. Yeah. Popcorn! <laughs>
um, barracks there in Fort McLeod. So it's a really interesting new brewery. And I think a lot of people, uh, as you said, Rob, you had a friend who just loves some of the beer down there. I think they are really emerging on the brewing scene. So let's, uh, let's crack this open and crack see it. what it looks like. Ooh, that sound. Yeah. <laughs> So the color is coming out quite nicely here, sort of a dark blonde uh, sort of color, which is right in the right in the middle of the style guideline. Um, a little hard to get the color on it here since we're in the dungeon, but uh, you know it's it's a nice clear beer. It's got some you know some nice small bubbles in it, so it's not overly carbonated, but it's it's a nice carbonation. Mm -hmm. Let's give it a little swirl to you know, pick up some of those esters in a here. Nice swirl, nice smell. It's got it's got a good it's got a good smell to it. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of citrus in there, which is which is pretty typical for this kind of beer. Again, this is you know we we've, we've mentioned in in with some of our other beers that you know in the nice hot summer after you're mowing your lawn or contemplating mowing your lawn, this is a good <laughs> good lawnmower beer. Well, gentlemen, thanks for having thanks us, Ross. Thanks, guys. Oh wow, that is good. That is nice. nice. Yeah. Wow. It's, it's, it's got kind of a, you can almost taste sort of the biscuity. Um, oh, immediately. I like the aftertaste, hey? That yeah. aftertaste of like it's grainy, it's not, it's yeah. smooth. It's very smooth. It's, it's quite a dry finish, too. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. That's really what do you think about those? We were trying to guess the IBUs. I think you're right, George. It's between like 20 and 40 for sure. It's yeah. so low. I'd, I'd say this is probably you know, right around 20, something like that. It's Yeah. yeah. I think this is just a beer you put back. Like yeah. I'm, just, yeah. like, I'm like this could go quickly here. Well, it's it's pretty decent body too. I mean, it's you know again the IBUs uh, contribute to that. So yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. What do you, what do you, what are your opinions there, Rob? So I'm not a expert. I don't even know what IBU means. But <laughs> this is probably my kind of beer. Not nice. Too, yeah. uh, I'm yeah. not an IPA guy and stuff. And I yeah. just like a crisp kind of. Like well, it's yeah. it, it refers to the bitterness. So this is. Kind of, you know, on the yeah, lower end of bitter, but it's low. it's really nice. Mm. Very smooth. So, uh, so Rob, tell us a bit about this jail cell and its preservation and just being here. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, so my dad started fixing it up a long time ago, and we had a restaurant in here, so we used the, the cells as the wine cellar, just kind of fit. <laughs> um, well, you know, uh, you could tell that 100 years ago, people seem to be a lot shorter because the doors are pretty low <laughs> and the cells are pretty pretty shallow and narrow. So, yeah. That's it. No, it's pretty good. It's Yeah, it's great down here. So, this is this is wonderful. Thanks for... Yeah, thanks. Thanks you know, for this great, great place to have this beer. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So, hey, enjoy the cream ale. Um, I think it's going to be, I think everyone who gets a kid's going to love it. I think yeah, it's are. a great summer beer. It's a great summer beer. That's nice. All right. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> All right. Welcome. We're on the rooftop here, the old fire hall. I'm here with George. I'm here with Rob. And we're going to talk, the, we're going to talk about the old fire hall. George. So um, what would be some of the, can you think of some of the landmarks, you know, since uh, this building's been in, in your family that, uh, you know, sort of stand out in your memory? When we started out, uh, my dad had a restaurant in here, mm -hmm. his own restaurant, and um, we've had a number of bars come through, uh, uh, longer term tenants, all kinds, from hair salons, lawyers, just about, just about everything. It's mm -hmm. pretty, you know, it's an easy fit for just about anything. Right. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, and Rob, how long has your father owned this building? I'm a bit. I'm only I, ten years in Lethbridge. So yeah, I curious. think it was mid '90s, '96 or '7. I think wow. is when he started. So he had to basically take it and uh, just he built his apartment first on the fourth floor, and he basically just you know got out of bed and went to work on on bringing it up to uh, a rentable building. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So Pretty well on his own, years, eh? really. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's beautiful up here. It's beautiful up here. <laughs> I mean, if, if people ever get the chance uh, to hook up with you to have a look at uh, the view from up here, it's one of the most spectacular views in the city. Yeah. So, you know, thanks very much for sharing it with us today. Yeah, no problem.